This is Bishop Michael Burbage, and you are listening to the Walk Humbly Podcast. Welcome to the Walk Humbly Podcast. I'm Billy Atwell, Chief Communications Officer for the Diocese and your co-host. If you haven't already, make sure you rate this podcast and write a review on iTunes, Google Play, or Stitcher. We're also on Overcast now as well. Sign up for our e-newsletter at arlingtondiocese.org, and you can follow Bishop Burbage on Twitter at Bishop Burbage. Now, if you'd like to send in a question for the bishop to answer here on the podcast, you want to email us, info at arlingtondiocese.org. Again, that's info at arlingtondiocese.org. I welcome your host, Bishop Burbage. Bishop, how are you? I'm doing well, Billy, and welcome to our listeners. So before we get to our main topics, we've got a couple of other things. The first is... How did you survive the Super Bowl? <laughs> I'm sure I, I feel like the way most people did, it was it was not the most exciting Super Bowl that, that I ever <laughs> yeah. watched. I had predicted that the uh, uh, Patriots were going to win by 10 points, but I thought it was going to be more like 40 to 30 yeah. instead of 13 to 3. Yeah. Uh, so I've never seen such a low-scoring Super Bowl. Yeah, especially with two dynamic uh, offenses. Uh, yeah. But defense showed up yesterday. They certainly did. So uh, February is Black History Month. You issued a statement on Black History Month. Uh, talk a little bit about what your message was in that statement. And again, we designate uh, certain weeks or certain months throughout the uh, calendar year uh, to highlight uh, contributions. And uh, in a sense, uh, every month is Black History Month. Right. Uh, but we, we highlight it in a special way just to raise our awareness. and. And reflect on the uh, many accomplishments uh, of individuals in, in, in from the African American community uh, in, in, in all areas and walks of life and science and sports and the arts, civil rights, politics. Mm -hmm. uh, but as Catholics, we especially remember the great contributions made by uh, African Americans and Black Catholics to the life of our church. And so it's it's a it's a time really to uh, acknowledge a history that certainly has. Uh, points of low points absolutely uh, but that that acknowledgement that awareness saying where there has been injustice we must never tire of, of promoting and working for justice and also to applaud and to celebrate and imitate uh, those who have made made so many uh, many positive uh, contributions to society Absolutely. And I know you're always uh, excited when we have the mass of the multicultural office and you see all these different communities coming together. And, you know, I, I think in your statement, too, you, you, by highlighting that it resonates with a lot of the masses and the events, different events that we have in the multicultural office. Right. That's who we are as a church. Uh, we we celebrate the diversity that is ours, the unique gifts, the unique histories. Uh, but we are one body. And when you see that played out, for example, in, in the Mass that you mentioned, it's just a beautiful reflection of the reality we hold to be true. Another group I know that you are uh, that you love deeply are our consecrated religious. Uh, you know, you went to schools growing up with uh, religious sisters and, and, and uh, so on. And this past weekend, we had the annual World Day for Consecrated Life. Um, you frequently attribute much of your, your faith as a young person to those who took that, that, that calling uh, so seriously. Talk a little bit about uh, what the memories of that day were for you. It's, again, it's, it's a day that we, we celebrate to lift up that particular vocation. And so we celebrated uh, World, the prayer, World Day of Prayer for Consecrated Life by gathering with our women religious in our diocese and honoring specifically those who were celebrating special jubilee years. Mm. And so represented by the jubilarians at the Mass I celebrated on Saturday, was 465 years of faithful service to the church, and wow. just in our jubilarians who were there. Right. And that doesn't include all the other sisters who were present. And so there's a sense of awe, like the great, the great ministries for all these years carried out by uh, those living con in, the, in consecrated life. And uh, it also, I mentioned to them that uh, we have over 150 uh, women and men religious serving our diocese, what a blessing that is. And we have 68 young people from our diocese, men and women, uh, in formation for Consecrated Life. So just as we do a, a poster for the seminarians, we just uh, came forth with a poster for those uh, who are in formation for Consecrated Life. So how blessed we are. And, and as you said, uh, whenever I talk uh, about religious, especially 
uh, women religious because they played such a special life uh, part of my life mm. uh, as a kindergarten student to a college student right. uh, as uh, helping in my faith formation. And uh, I have been so blessed uh, to be served so well. And so thanks to all of our men and women religious serving in our church and serving in our diocese. And we talk so frequently about the need for more uh, priestly vocations. We talk about that a lot, but you're, you regularly call for vocations to consecrated life too. There are people out there who have this call that maybe that don't know it. And these 68 people in formation and the, the, the 150 you said that are serving in our diocese, these are people living that witness. So I, I would implore, and I'm sure you would too, anyone listening that if, if you know someone that maybe has a vocation to consecrate life, or maybe you have one yourself, reach out to one of these people, talk to them, talk, ask them about their journey, just as you would if you were discerning the priesthood, you would talk to a priest. I, you know, do that with someone who's in consecrated well, life that's as how, well. That's how the Lord helps people to hear the call through yeah. other people. Like, hey, have you ever thought about being a priest or a consecrated religious? I think you'd be really great. Sometimes you're that instrument uh, right. as a lay person or as another priest or religious. You're that instrument to, to help others to hear that call. So pray for that increase of vocations, mm. but also maybe consider. Maybe the Lord's asking you to invite someone to consider. Very good. All right, so our first main topic, uh, New York passed a law that allowed abortions to be performed by non-doctors up to the point of birth. Uh, Governor Cuomo, who touts his Catholic faith, kind of brushed off criticism of the law, stating that the Catholic Church doesn't believe in a woman's right to choose. Yes, I understand their religious view. Uh, since then, other states have shown support for similar law. And then a proposal uh, in Virginia by uh, Delegate Kathy Tran uh, failed in committee, but our own governor said that an infant could be delivered and then the physician and the mother would decide if that child lives. There was a question of if he was calling infanticide um, in some of his comments that followed. Um, what were your thoughts as we were going talking about the legislation? And then obviously the follow-up comments of the governor um, were really staggering. And I think a lot of people were taken by surprise here. Luckily, we had the Virginia Catholic Conference calling this to our attention, letting people know to speak out. What were your thoughts when you saw this bill and then the governor's comments? Well, Billy, like so many of the faithful that I have spoken to in, these, uh, in this past week especially, uh, like them, I just share uh, shock uh, and, and outrage and, you know, the fact that, that we're at this point uh, has been really horrific. It's really been very, very unsettling days, um, and I think it has uh, shocked the core, uh, to the very core of our being, uh, in, in hearing that bill explain and hearing the, uh, the governor's uh, comments, and uh, very, very, very disturbing. Uh, uh, you know, the grotesque uh, descriptions of abortion, even in, in the uh, latest stages of, of a baby's development. Uh, you almost can't believe it. It's true. When I saw the video of Delegate Tran describing, and I'm so how thankful we are with that video was made available and, and publicized, it was so clear what was being discussed. Whereas if it was just in text, I don't know if we would have truly grasped right. that this is really what it was going to do. But she admitted right there um, it, it, uh, to a, a committee exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, well, there's something, as you said, very powerful when you, you, you actually hear and see the, those words being spoken by uh, Delegate Tran and, and also the governor. I mean, uh, the Delegate Tran admitted that even if a woman was physically in the process of labor, her, her bill would allow that baby to be killed. I mean, she said that. It's unimaginable. Uh, and we know how violent abortion is. Uh, and then the governor described, uh, you know, keeping a newborn baby comfortable and uh, that he or she would only be res re resuscitated if the family wanted to. Uh, and then said that then we would decide what happened next. Uh, so, so confusing. What are you talking about? Yeah. You know, what are you talking about? Uh, so we have seen uh, what happens, um, you know, when a society fails uh, to protect the sacredness of all human life at every stage. This, this is what happens. Right, uh, right. Abortion advocates have gone too far, uh, and we have seen an outcry like we have never seen uh, in years. So one, in a sense, if you want to call it a blessing that has come from this, these past disturbing days, is the fact that it has really awakened people. It has. Uh, it has awakened people. And I ask anyone listening uh, to join us in our pro-life efforts uh, Go to our website, see how you can help us. Contact your parishes. Uh, parishes have wonderful pro-life ministries that work uh, to save babies and help expectant mothers. Uh, we need your help uh, more than ever. You have seen 
uh, how far some elected officials are willing to go. We cannot, we cannot allow this to happen. Uh, we know, uh, we've seen in, in these past days, uh, the impact of, of social media. Yeah, that has played a major role. Right? It's obviously in communications, I'm following these things. It was staggering to see how fast that spread. Right, exactly. Uh, and I think for two reasons. Uh, I think first, because Delegate, uh, Delegate Tran and Governor Northam's comments were so horrendous and dangerous for our country, people were just stunned. Yeah, uh, They just said, I have to do something. And uh, people share those videos on social media, and it caught on. So I would encourage our people to at least take the step of sharing these kind of things on social media to help to build the awareness. It's almost like a form of ministry, right? right? It's very easy. It's not like we would typically think of working at a soup kitchen or a homeless shelter. But to see on social media something like this and sharing it, it's like a ministry of education or information for those who don't know. Right, exactly. I mean, it's almost like a form of evangelization of just— this is what we believe, but look what's happening right. and what a violation that is of, of our No, absolutely our right. And again, in addition to that, uh, the social media, uh, we, as we always say, um, it's, we always are praying uh, for the sacredness of, of human life, our advocacy. Mm-hmm. And I really strong, that's why I have asked, and I keep repeating, I hope this word is getting out. I asked the pastors to announce it this weekend. I want the faithful in this diocese to sign up to Re, uh, as a member, as a recipient of the Virginia Catholic Conference mm-hmm. uh, e- email list, yeah. uh, we are blessed in the state in, in, in Virginia in having this Virginia Catholic Conference, of which Bishop Nestow and I serve on, of course. Uh, but they are constantly listening to what is being proposed about legislation, keeping us informed, and providing us with opportunities to act. And so please, if you have not signed up to, to uh, be on that list as a member of Virginia Catholic Conference, I strongly, uh, strongly encourage you. And show up, you know. I mean, I heard that uh, Delegate Tran was, was going to have a town hall meeting, and people said, well, you know what, we're going to be outside uh, to, to let, let her know uh, yeah. what we're thinking here. And it, it, I think wisely the town hall meeting was canceled, but the rally went on. Right. right. And the rally went on. Uh, you know, did. proclaiming the sacredness of life, a rally yeah. that was peaceful. It was, you know, celebrating the gift of life itself. So we can make a difference. And you know what I heard too, uh, and repeatedly, is phone calls. Yes. Phone calls to our, our, the representatives, our elected officials. They count. They mm-hmm. literally count. And, you know, when a certain issue receives a certain amount of phone calls, uh, that elected official is informed and said, wait, wait a second, you have to hear where people really are on this. Yeah. So, you know, more than ever, uh, you, dear friends, uh, our, our prayer, our advocacy, our witness uh, on behalf of life is absolutely uh, essential. And, you know, you said that they count phone calls. They also count, like we were saying a second ago, social media. They look to see what is the impact. What do people think? And right. social media gives everybody a voice. There's another way that people have a voice when they vote. Exactly. And the Virginia Catholic Conference puts out a voter guide for the for elections and right. shows where the candidates stand on issues. We don't have a partisan stance. We never right. have a political home in the church. You know, certain parties, they like us on one issue, they don't like us on another. So we don't have That's right. too many friends in that space. But we put out that voter guide through the Virginia Catholic Conference because it matters. And this, what we're seeing, is a consequence of elections. We have to have pro-life politicians in office. They need to support what we believe. Otherwise, right. look how far it can go. Yeah, and find ways, as we do also, to to encourage and commend those who are, are supporting uh, such pro-life efforts. Uh, they pay a price for that, and we yeah. have to find ways to support them also. So if you'd like to sign up for the Virginia Catholic Conference, they've got an email list. They don't bombard your email just when they need to contact you. They do. Um, it's vacatholic.org. That's when you can get to the Virginia Catholic Conference and see all the different resources that they have there. Um, also, if you go to arlingtondiocese.org, you can go to our Office of Respect Life, and they've got great resources for people. They can show you where you can volunteer. Um, but there's also two ministries that, that support uh, women and children. Uh, Project Rachel, which is a, a really critical ministry for, for women who are post-abortive. Uh, and then uh, the Gabriel Project, which is obviously to help women who um, have uh, or having babies and that they need help, you know, right. financially or whatever it might be. Clothing, and all of this. Yeah, this, so yeah. there are a lot of ways you can help in ways big and small. Please sign up for the Virginia Catholic Conference email list and, and reach out to our Respect Life office and see how you can help them as well. 
And they, you know, as we have posted on our diocese websites, both Bishop Nestel and I uh, spoke promptly and issued statements after yeah. hearing uh, uh, Governor Northam's comments. Uh, and so, you know, I refer people to our diocesan websites as well. Absolutely. ArlingtonDiocese.org. Before we move on from this topic entirely, Bishop, actually, one last thing. The governor's in the hot seat again because a photo from his medical school yearbook was published. And on his personal page, there was a photo of two men. Uh, one was in, in blackface, another in a, a Ku Klux Klan outfit. Uh, Governor Northam, he initially admitted being one of the men, but now he says it's not him. It's not quite clear kind of where that's going to be resolved. Um, you, you issued a statement, and in the context of your previous comments about the unborn and his comments on that, and you said, uh, with the extremely disturbing photos of Governor Northam's medical school yearbook, we see another offense against the dignity of human life, the sin of racism. I thought it was beautifully how you tie those together. Um, not that they're the same issue, but there's a common thread, violation of human life and dignity. Well, Talk that's a little it. bit about that. That's what we're consistent about, you know, the sacredness of all human life, the dignity of all persons without exception. That's the beauty of the gospel of life, the teachings of Jesus. And, you know, those photos that, that appeared, uh, you know, were very, very disturbing, unsettling, and certainly, you know, raised us of the hurt and pain that people have endured throughout the years. And then seeing something like that again, only back in 1984, yeah. uh, very, very, very unsettling. His, the way uh, the governor responded, uh, acknowledging that it, it was he in the photos. I mean, the fact that... Either you you remember doing or you don't. Right, uh, right. That that is what I think brought such outrage, and and the fact that they were even on on, on that page. Um, so I I think that uh, the this incident is a, another issue of uh, you know when when the dignity of all human persons is not up, upheld, uh, then we as a society are not being the people that w- that we're called to be, and. Uh, you know, the governor uh, has to uh, know that there are consequences. Uh, not that God doesn't forgive us. God always forgives us. But there are consequences mm-hmm. um, to to past decisions and behaviors. And certainly, as I understand it, as we speak today, he is, uh, you know, considering his, if yeah. he's going to be uh, effective in being able uh, to lead us. So I hope he does what is right and what is best uh, for Virginia. And we always talk about in the context of human life and dignity, it's it's not just for the unborn, it's anyone's social condition, anyone's financial condition, um, whether they're healthy or not, because we think about with the elderly, but certainly in the context of respecting people's race, it's not something you can control. Right. It's, it, what, what an offense to, to see that. And um, so I, I know our, our uh, you put out a statement about that. Again, that's on arlingtondiocese.org, and we've gotten great response from it our was, black yeah, Catholic was, ministries again, as well. Again, it was very unnerving. It's, it's yeah. Almost, it's hard to believe almost. So um, moving on to the next topic, uh, it's been a little bit out of the news, but it, it, it happened since our last podcast. So I wanted to get your, your response to it. But um, the students at uh, Covington High School uh, who were initially uh, scolded for seemingly harassing and teasing a Native American man after the March for Life in Washington it kind of put a little bit of a black eye on the march, which had gone so well and had so many um, uh you know, young people passionately turning out. Uh, it turned out later that the boys didn't seem to approach the man. Again, this is another one of those stories where the details kind of unraveled as, as we went. Um, many people uh, publicly retracted their initial anger and community again through social media and then apologized for rushing to judgment. Lots of people, public figures, intellectuals, all kinds of folks. Um, and this actually includes their own bishop who issued an apology and said that he felt quote, bullied and pressured into making a statement prematurely, and he took full responsibility for that. Uh, first, what was your response to the story related to the young men and the way they uh, they were treated? And then second, what was your reaction to the, the Covington bishop's response? Well, first of all, uh, I, I also felt, you know, very badly that this became the story yeah. uh, of, the, of the March for Life because— uh, I, the night before the march, as I mentioned in our last podcast, I was with you know close to nine thousand young people, uh, you know peacefully and joyfully uh, proclaiming the gospel of life. I, I marched with thousands of young people the next day again, peacefully and joyfully proclaiming the sacredness of all human life. It was such a proud moment uh, for our church to see so many young people uh, of of all faiths actually uh, gathering together on behalf of life. And then that was this. This became the story yeah. that was reported. And again, it's a lesson that, you know, we have to be careful, especially when we see things on social media, because it can be manipulated. Right. And it's best, you know, although people want a timely response, it's, it's best to wait to make sure we know the whole story. The Governor Northam thing was different because he admitted 
he, yeah, he initially, that right one night now. initially he admitted it. So you say, well, there, he, there is his answer, own words. Right. Uh, so I think you know we have to always be careful, um, you know, to to, to jump in, jump into judgment. Uh, again, it's you know it's just the up the experience itself reminds us that you know there are going to be uh, in, in in our world in our lives people who disagree with us. Uh, people who actually reject us and ridicule us. And uh, so no matter whether we, when we are the recipient uh, of such behavior, how is it that we conduct ourselves? Mm. So it's hopefully that it's always um, respectful, you know, not, not backing down to who we are and what we believe, of course not, you know, but being respectful of people who may disagree with us and even having to suffer for it, uh, that's okay too. But never uh, allowing that to to lead um, uh, to an, an ill-tempered or you know violence in, in our words or speech or even our actions. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, how that was handled, uh, you know, we didn't see the whole picture, right. uh, but we know how it should be handled. Mm-hmm. And uh, and so that's ju- just a, a reminder of that. Moving on to a more positive. Oh, I'm sorry. You yes. did, I knew there was another question you asked me about that, about the bishop's response. Right, right, yeah. right. Uh, yeah, and then he, he apologized. He, he yeah. understood that, you know, I jumped, you know, too quickly into this. And let, let's take a look at the whole picture. And lots of lessons to be learned here. Lots and of it's lessons. a stressful thing when you have, I'm sure they had national media outlets from around the world right. calling them. That, that is an, yeah. a pressure that's unlike any other. Yeah. So moving on to a more positive topic. Uh, the BLA is kicking off. So this is the time of year when we kick off the Bishop's Lenten Appeal. You've been traveling around the diocese. You've been visiting with parishes and with uh, donors, mm-hmm. talking about the critical uh, funds that are provided and how they're used. Uh, what has been your message to the faithful about this initiative? Well, first of all, I'm so uh, grateful for the theme. We always use a theme you know, to guide us through the Bishop's Lenten Appeal. And it, it, the one we chose this year, I and mean, we chose it way back uh, before Christmas, uh, but it seems timely and providential. It's together in the light of Christ. And so what that implies is that there is darkness. Mm -hmm. And we have seen the darkness in recent weeks and days, as we have discussed most of this podcast. Right. There is darkness in our midst, truly. But what do we do in the midst of it? And and we don't despair. You know, we're we're believers. That's why we were at church yesterday, on, on Sunday, Saturday was because we believe that every time we celebrate Mass, we celebrate that Jesus, by his own suffering, death, resurrection, proved victorious, conquered, dispelled the darkness once for all. The light is more powerful. So therefore, it is essential that we walk together in that light, Hmm. which will remind us of the need to speak the truth, uh, to suffer for the truth, to advocate for the truth, uh, we, we, we have to, in word and deed and example, uh, radiate the truth of, of, of God, of, of the light of Christ. But we do that together. We do that together. So with so many people experiencing darkness, they often feel overwhelmed or forgotten because many times they're... They, they feel abandoned even uh, by others. They, they're, they're suffering. They're poor. They're without the basic necessities of life. So how are they going to see the light of Christ? Well, we're given the privileged opportunity and role by these 40 ministries mm-hmm. that are supported by the Bishop's Latin Appeal. Yeah. Why, why are they here? To radiate, to bring the light of Christ to others in, in need. We can do that together. And I assured my biggest message that I, I keep assuring the faithful of, every gift donated to the Bishop's Lenten Appeal is directed to those ministries, including our work, great work of Catholic Charities, you know, directed to those ministry that help to bring the light of Christ to people who need us to respond to their pastoral and spiritual needs. So your contribution to the Bishop's Lenten Appeal is a response to God's call to radiate his light. And kind of the elephant in the room, because you had gotten a lot of questions through phone calls, we've gotten emails about, you know, how are BLA funds, do they go to settlements, to, you know, in the, in the context of the abuse crisis, there was some questions around that. So you kind of boiled down a lot of what you've gotten in those questions, even beyond what we published in the question and answer resource that we published on the child protection page of our website. Um, you kind of boiled some of those down 
And we got a lot of great feedback from people that weren't aware. Even people who are reading our materials and things, they, they weren't aware. Talk a little bit about what that summary yeah, was. Yeah, I think we're posting a video uh, from our speaker at the Bishop's Lent right. Appeals Receptions, Tim Cotton, our, our uh, diocese finance officer, that really reassures the people that uh, we are not responsible. We're not connected. It, this is the, the Catholic Church structure. We're not connected or responsible uh, for any other diocese, you know, not Washington, not Richmond, or, you know, we're not responsible. Our funds are not responsible or connected to uh, a- anything like that. They are used in the way that they're in- intended. Uh, you know, we, we spoke about uh, in, in that uh, presentation uh, that in since the founding of our diocese in 1974, uh, $110,000 have has been spent on settlements from insurance funds. Right. Yeah, not from funds directed to uh, uh, gifts given to a special collection. In fact, they go to where it is announced. It's the yeah. same thing with the Bishop's Lenten Appeal. So anyone who, you know, would, would think that, well, because I'm upset with the crisis in the church right now, I'm suspending my gift to the Bishop's Lenten Appeal. Well, what you're doing, you're impacting negatively the work we do to help others. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so that's just a gift. I mean, I res- yeah. I, I'm respectful of everyone's decisions and discernment, but I hope it's based on, on the facts and realities that we're trying to, to convey so clearly, especially at this, in this year. And there, so if you'd like to see that video, go to arlingtondiocese.org, and you can check out the development office who handles the Bishop's Lenten Appeal. They have that video there. Also, if you wanted to, if you had other questions related to the abuse crisis and how it works, you know, financial questions even, if you go to arlingtondiocese.org slash child protection, we published a, a long document of the most frequently asked questions that we've gotten, and it's published right at the top there. You can download the PDF and read that and go through and see what questions you might have had, and, and many of them are, are answered there. So, Bishop, we've got two questions from the faithful. Uh, the first one's from Suzanne from St. Veronica's in Chantilly. She said, what is the church doing to engage a minister to the falsely accused? I'm just, she's meaning uh, in the clergy abuse crisis, priests who were falsely accused. Everything without exception, I see, talks about the passionate response to punishing those who um, are abusers, which is good, but to those in the clergy who aren't credibly accused, there is a void. So if you'd respond to that question. Sure. And as we say, whenever we receive an accusation of abuse, um, just to remind everyone that that, ac- that accusation is reported immediately to law enforcement. Right. And, uh, and then upon, if they were unable uh, to move forward with that accusation, then we, with the help of laymen and laywomen on a diocesan review board, can t- conduct our own um, in, internal investigation, right. and they uh, would provide a recommendation. If it's found credible, then that priest is no longer in priestly ministry. Just, just to summarize that. Mm-hmm. But the process is what we would, in any walk of life, allow for due process. And so there must be respect for both parties uh, the person who brings forth the accusation, the person who is accused, who says, no, this did not happen. Okay, so right away now we have a discrepancy. So now you have to uh, investigate, Mm -hmm. and you do that with the help of experts and interviews and the information that is gained, and you allow that information to surface, and where does the the evidence weigh? Right, and that goes to a diocesan review board that assesses that. Yes, now in the meantime, everyone's respected, confidentiality is respected, um, and, 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 and sometimes it takes time. Because there's a lot of moving parts here. And in the meantime, uh, I, I would ask everyone to understand that sometimes it takes longer than what people hope for. Uh, but because we want to get this right, we want to be thorough, we want to be respectful. And to know, just kind of like we were talking about in our previous segment, that you may not have all the information. Mm. Uh, and so because there's confidentiality, because you're not entitled to that information. Right. But those carry out the investigation will have it. Uh, so it's, it's it, but it, it, as as it relates to the priest throughout this process, uh, he is supported. He is uh, in a sense of you know he's still connected to the diocese. Mm-hmm. Uh, nothing's cut off. He's just ten- tentatively uh, not in his active ministry. So this process can play out. 
And, you know, she makes the point that, you know, for those who are incredibly accused, their name is publicly known. So typically the fact that there was an accusation is publicly known because part of the process is telling the parishes where they served. If anyone has information right. about this, please bring it forward. And if it, it turns out that the accusation is not credible, the church has an obligation to work to to go back and let people know the outcome of that because they have a right to a good name. Right, and quite realistically, um, you know, that that's a very, very difficult challenge. Yes. Uh, and this is the sad part of this, is that, you know, that process is in place for the reasons you described, but that name's out there. And, you know, unfortunately, sometimes in society and our weak human nature, uh, that's all we hear, and that, that priest's name is, um, you know, impacted mm-hmm. for a long time. Right. And so it's an obligation of me as bishop, an obligation of the church to restore that good name. But I would be naive if I said that that this does not present a challenge. And right. so that's why we always pray, God, that it's always the truth that surfaces. Absolutely. So our next question is from Joseph at St. Agnes Parish. What qualifies someone as a Catholic when the Annuarium Statisticum, compiled by the Central Office of Church Statistics, says there are 1.2 billion Catholics in the world? So that's a number that we use a lot, 1.2 billion Catholics. Where are we exactly getting that number from? Yeah, that's basically by those who are the the baptisms, Mm -hmm. you know, so we count the number of people baptized. Therefore, that's, that's how we come up with that number. It's a little bit different when you say how many... Uh, Catholics are in the diocese. The only way we can really know that is uh, through re- registration. Right, right. You know, like uh, if, if you, the Atwell family moves in to the Diocese of Arlington, you register in your parish, we count that number. So that's mm-hmm. why I do encourage people to register in parishes. Absolutely. You know, yeah. based on circumstances, they can worship, you know, in different churches because of schedules or whatever. But it's good to have a, a registration because that gives us a, a more accurate number, certainly would help us in, in, in our in our planning. Mm-hmm. And we say we estimate, you know, there's, what, 425,000 uh, Catholics in the Diocese of Arlington. It's probably more like 600,000, right, you know. Right. Uh, but that's why I do encourage people uh, to, to register when they can. But the answer to uh, Joseph's question was is through the, the baptisms that we know. Very good. So, Bishop, some of the, the segments that we went through in this podcast are pretty heavy. Some are very sad uh, and obviously impact us locally. Um, if you would offer just kind of your final thoughts and then if you would send us off with your blessing. Yeah, and to sadly acknowledge that we are at a, a very uh, challenging, difficult time uh, in our nation right now, especially as we see uh, the extremes that people will go, uh, you know, who do not uh, embrace the, the gospel of life. And uh, I'm very, very concerned uh, and we all have reason to be concerned, and we all need to play a part, especially through our prayer, our advocacy, and our witness. We cannot sit still, and we must let our voice be known and speak the, the, the truth in love and uh, do so courageously. Uh, beautiful words that um, the Lord gave us in yesterday's reading. It's not always easy, you know, to to be out there courageously, uh, you know, defending and living the gospel, uh, but the Lord said, uh, have no fear. I am here to deliver you. And he is. And that should be the source of our consolation and the source of our strength. And that is what allows us to walk humbly with our God. Thank you for listening to the Walk Humbly podcast. Make sure you check out more episodes on iTunes, Google Play, and Stitcher. You can follow me on Twitter at Bishop Burbage, where I offer spiritual reflections each morning in the gospel and share photos and updates of what is going on in the Diocese of Arlington. Stay up to date with news, event information, inspirational content, and more by subscribing to our e-newsletter at arlingtondiocese.org.